Hey everybody, it's the Modern Customer Podcast and I am your host, Blake Morgan, just off the heels of a trip to Miami, Florida, where I had the opportunity to speak to hundreds of hearing aid specialists and saleswomen. Um, That was awesome. And now I'm back at home in California and I'm producing this awesome show. My guest today is Eric Berdoulis, Vice President of Customer Experience at Lyft. Eric is responsible for ensuring that every Lyft driver and passenger receives the most seamless ride experience possible. Eric joined Lyft in 2014. He was working on systems to build the best in class experience for Lyft's community of drivers and passengers, even as the company scaled from an 18 million ride to 900 million ride annually over the past six years. How does he do it? He leads a cross-functional team focused on creating an effortless experience. So he's very focused on reducing friction, and that's what we're going to talk about in this interview. We'll be talking about their approach to customer experience and how they make it so frictionless. Please enjoy this episode with Eric. Hey, Eric, welcome to the Modern Customer Podcast. How have you been? I'm good. Thanks for inviting me. I'm excited to chat today. Yeah, we were just talking about work from home problems and you said you have toddlers. So tell us, like, how many kids do you have and what are their ages? I have uh, two daughters, uh, Lucy, who's four, and Winnie, who's two. Um, they go to preschool four days a week, but uh, there's definitely some overlap in between the times that I'm still working and the times that they are not in preschool. Right. And uh, so generally a call or two a day, I get a screaming child running up the stairs. Um, but right now they are at preschool, so hopefully no interruptions. Yeah, because um, when I had my second, I guess you're, you and your wife too had a child during COVID. Was it like May or, or April or May, apparently, of 2020? Yeah, so our, our second was born February 13th, okay. and there was a tornado in Nashville two weeks later, oh, and no. it passed a block from our house. And so we went from a uh, two-week-old newborn to tornado in Nashville, and then a week or two after the tornado and having power out for a while, COVID hit. Um, so very eventful having a kid during the pandemic on top of everything else. Yeah, it's really, it tests your patience, definitely, and can relate, you know, Work is easy for me compared to sometimes managing <laughs> like a two-year-old and a five-year-old, but they are absolute blessings. Let's talk about you and your career journey. Let's just kick off by hearing your story and how you came to be in this awesome role at Lyft. Yeah, totally. So I started at Lyft seven and a half years ago. Um and I was hired as the senior ma- manager of driver retention operations. And so it was all about how do we keep drivers on the platform? Very quickly, um, there was some turnover at the executive level and uh, everyone that was running their support team left. And they're like, you have background in that. Can you help us scale out customer support? And typical startup fashion, 150 employees. I was like, sure, that sounds like fun. And uh, so it's kind of been falling into all these roles and it's, it's evolved from 40 people out of the office in San Francisco running a 24 seven operation to scaling contact centers all over the world, all across the U S and then about uh, three years in, we built out this office in Nashville, Tennessee. I relocated here about three and a half years ago. And so we have about 500 people in our customer experience team here in Nashville now. And uh, currently my, my scope is I run the customer experience team for Lyft. And so that's, we have a group of product managers and engineers that build the technology for people to interface um, with, with our help in app um, whenever people have problems. And then we have all of our frontline teams, uh, the thousands of people that serve uh, drivers and riders that have, uh, have problems with, with the service or with connecting each other. So it's, uh, it's been a lot of fun the last seven years. I mean, like startups never keep you bored and that's always been the case at Lyft. 
That is such a valuable experience that you've been there since the beginning. You've seen Lyft scale and grow, and now it's a huge company. What are some of your best practices for even coming into this role of a VP of customer experience? Like, If, if you could give advice to your younger self about this role, what would you say? Yeah, I, I think... I think stay curious is, is probably my best advice. Um, my, my observation is there's been like times in my career and I've observed times in others where you get, you get stale and you stop asking questions about like what could be better or what should I be doing right now that I'm not currently doing um, or what are we missing as a team? Um, and I, I think you can get jaded on the customer experience front in, in the sense that um, people will always have problems. There's always, and, and I think one of the things that attracts me to customer experience just as a career generally is I love helping people, but there's no end game. There's, it's a constant iteration process of like, how can you be better than you were before? And um, customers' expectations change. And so it's, it's ever evolving. But I think stay, staying curious helps you stay in that place of like learning and questioning what you do and evolving as, as your customers evolve. That's such good advice to be curious. And I mean, running a contact center is a really hard job, but you really like, it sounds like built the contact center and the customer experience team. Um, when you set out to start doing that, what were some of the problems you aimed to solve at the beginning? So at the very start, um, the, the team was 40 people in SF and we were 12 weeks behind on customer support tickets. Oh, so wow. like I said, I came in as a um, driver retention operations manager. And my first problem, I was like, we're just not answering drivers questions when they come to us. And this is early days of Lyft, like being in two cities. And if we want to keep people on our platform, like you have to engage with them, you have to figure out how to do it. And so um, I, I think the early problem, the problem in the first three years that we were solving is how do we scale from 40 people to hundreds to thousands to just keep pace with like Lyft's ten, multiple 10x growth cycles. And so I, um, I, I think we did that relatively successfully. It's onboarding a lot of people. But I think uh, all of that comes back to like, how do you center um, employees at the center of all of that, because when you're doubling your team every six months or even more than two Xing your team every six months, you want to make sure you have the right people in the team, the right people leading the team. And, um, that's, that's hard to do as you continue to scale. And so I, I think it's just keeping, keeping the leads on those teams at the center and then keeping your employees, your frontline, um, customer support folks at the center of all of that. A lot of companies have baggage about the contact center. The contact center is not a place that people want to hear about. They often aren't interested in going in there. They're not as curious about the contact center. What would you say the overall, I won't say vibe, but attitude is toward customer service, customer experience, the contact center at your company? I... I think there's a tremendous amount of importance placed on it. I think if you have a customer centric organization, and I would definitely say Lyft is one, you, you pay attention to the things that your customers have problems with. And the people that are hearing those problems day in, day out are the customer service folks. And so uh, from an experiential lens, we, we have a lot of our technology teams that actually actively either shadow folks that do customer service um, or put themselves in driver's shoes and like go drive for Lyft so they can understand and dog food our own product and figure out what works and what doesn't. And so I, I would say from just kind of a high level perspective, there's there's a lot of respect for the people that, that work, um, that pick up phones, that answer chats, that work on social media, um, really the face and voice of the brand, the millions of people that that talk to us um, every year and such a important marketing channel. But I, I would say the attitude is very customer centric. You know, it's important if there's problems and you, you aren't paying attention to them, um, you're, you're missing a big chunk of business and a lot of people inevitably churning and stopping to use whatever service you're selling. Well, Eric, since you mentioned that Lyft is customer centric, one of the burning questions that my audience has, I'm sure is, well, if you are customer centric, what does measurement look like? 
as far as like, how do you know you're being successful? Because obviously this is, measurement is a hugely debated topic in the contact center world. So would you share with us how you measure and what success looks like? Yeah, so I think the, the first is, is probably not an entirely new construct, like comes from Six Sigma with like DPMO, like you have defects per million things that you're, you're doing. And I think a lot of the start of customer service is figuring out like, what are people having problems with and how many of those problems are there? And so I, I start with that as kind of a macro point, like your, your support should be relatively easy to access, but you should be measuring the upstream funnel and finding out how many problems people have. Um, from there, it's, uh, for me, it's an ease question, like how easy is it for people to get help when they want help? Um, so we measure that in, in a couple of different ways. Like one is just like, clicks to get to either a human or to a self-service um, automation. Um, and then the sentiment measure we use is customer effort score. Um, just fundamentally believing that it should be easy for people to get help. It should be easy for people to use Lyft. Um, the reason that Lyft, I believe, was so disruptive, um, I, I think we're coming up on our 10-year anniversary 10 years ago, is because um, taxis weren't easy. But calling a car with your phone is. And everything about our service should um, mirror that ease. So CES is really important to us. And then just uh, contact center measures. We, we look at um, service levels, like how quickly we're answering chats and, and phone calls as a, as a proxy for that ease. If you're sitting on hold for 30 minutes, it, it isn't easy and that will absolutely come out of sentiment, but um, look at other guardrail measures like SLAs, um, to, to dictate how, how easy it is to use, but really start with defect rate right? and, and categorize how, how much pain there is on your platform as a, as a way to start actually actively advocating for the removal of that pain. I like that. So starting with how much pain is there and then trying to yeah. block and tackle from there. Let's talk about contact center agent behavior. I think a lot of people grew, a lot of people listening grew their digital customer service presence during COVID, but it's not always easy to measure the call center versus the digital service. So I'm curious to hear what kind of changes were made as far as um, metrics or management as you came, became more digital in your customer service um, spectrum. Yeah. So I, I think the trajectory of COVID for us was an interesting one. Like it almost overnight, uh, a chunk of our business vanished. And, and so a lot of customer support cases vanished as well. Like we just didn't need the thousands of people that we had. Um, and we were able to, um, able to put uh, folks on hold. So it wasn't precisely letting, letting a ton of people go for the volume to pick back up. And what we also saw was people were contacting us at greater rates about new things. Like you're getting in a car with someone else and um, you want to understand how that functions. And so things that weren't issues before were suddenly issues and we had to figure that out. I, I think the big thing that we did in kind of this digital transformation is not just focusing on um, automating pieces of our service, but really going through and uh, rethinking all parts of our entry points from the ground up. And so what I mean by that is we were very like, we have a web-based contact form and that's how most, most people get in contact with us. And we spent that first year of COVID actually building out a digital in-app way for people to access help. So very, very in the moment, very connected to your usage and history on the platform and uh, trying to create um, very easy entry points in, into help, but simultaneously taking those top problems and what we know our best agents were doing and then solving them proactively back in the app. And with kind of that cycle, we were able to eliminate over the course of kind of the last two years, 65% of contacts uh, at, at least that defect rate as, as we were experiencing a pre pandemic. So we, we kind of are coming out of the pandemic now and, um, 2022, uh, a lot better position, not only to deliver like better, easier service, like easier to access experience, um, better, like in app service connected to, to chat and live, live agents, but, um, 
but also uh, it's more more efficient and effective uh, from from just kind of a cost perspective as well. And so it was a big transition. Now it's it was kind of taking the old web help form that just connected to an agent and uh, really being thoughtful about every piece of the journey about when people were having problems and trying to intentionally design those. So you mentioned digital transformation, which is an awesome thing to talk about right now because so many of our listeners on this podcast and viewers are still knee deep in a digital transformation that was, you know, COVID induced. They had to start working on the digital transformation or speed it up. Can you just give us a timeline and and a um, bird's eye view of your digital transformation and like how what it looked like? Yeah. So we, we started with this premise <clears throat> that we wanted to figure out if we could eliminate 90% of our contacts, but do so in a way that actually improved our net promoter score. So that was that was a whole premise. It was, uh, let's just figure out how to do this. We, wow. we know we want to do this. We know we need to do it. And um, it was one of those 10x goals at a time that like I, I think we needed needed something specific and tangible to rally around. And so we started talking to our frontline agents and our frontline managers about what are the tasks that you all do every day where you don't feel like you're adding a lot of value to the customer. Um, and it could be something as, as simple as you're just refunding the cancellation fee. And every single time you get that type of contact, you refund the cancellation fee. Um, and then we, we inventoried literally a list of thousands of these types of ideas and we started prioritizing which ones we could move into the app, which ones we could make proactive. So as opposed to waiting for a customer to reach out to us, actually um, taking the action that would be taken by the agent when that event happened in the system. So starting to log system events that we believed might have problems and checking with customers and asking them like, hey, it looks like this may have happened to you. Would you like us to fix it? And mm-hmm. then fixing it for them programmatically. Um, but it's that... Uh, old, fairly terrible metaphor of like, how do you eat an elephant? It's like one bite at a time. It was literally cataloging like thousands of problems and then saying, which one should we move into the app first and um, prioritizing the ones that had the biggest impact. And we didn't get to the 90%, but we we did get north of 65, which is still just kind of an incredible win. And over the same period of time improved um, our customer effort score uh, by roughly roughly double. So we, we also saw that we weren't, we weren't making it harder to contact us. We we're actually just making the experience of how people used, used our app and access support better, which I think is a huge win. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So talk to us about the digital transformation dinner table. Who was sitting around the table, so to speak? Obviously you run customer experience. Who else was at the table to get this digital transformation going? Yeah, so starts starts with the data. Like we we had our um, our partners from our data science team and our insights and analytics team um, helping kind of that that front. Like let's catalog problems. I, I think the other thing that we we started to do around that time and can talk a little bit about the journey that we're on now, but is we started attaching um, retention as a factor to the pain that was being caused, and so when something uh, like a bad event happened in our system, we would start to track that driver or rider for usage down the road to start to figure out, is this an event that causes them to churn? And mm-hmm. as such, like that was a different lever that we prioritized. So we started with, with science and analytics, and then it was our, our product and operations and engineering teams really in a room talking about how hard is this to build? Um, how big of an impact would it be? Um, and what does the solution look like now? Because it's already happening. People are contacting us. People are calling us or emailing us about this problem. And what does a great resolution for this thing look like? So that was a lot of the frontline people in the room. And then our, uh, our product team, who, who's brilliant, took all of those different inputs and combined it into a roadmap of the things that we should proceed to automate, the things that we should move upstream into our app, the things we should get proactive about, and obviously, it's there's no end game here. It's an ongoing journey. Our, our consumers change. Our contact types change. We add different services, and and so we we're still we're still kind of proceeding down that journey. And there's there's always more that we can do um, as as we continue. 
I didn't hear about marketing, so marketing would not be involved. Um, they, they weren't in kind of this upstream exercise. Um, and I would say at the time, honestly, at first few months of COVID, there was just a lot going on. And uh, I, I would say each department was scrambling on each individual problem. And I think this, this one was one that we uniquely, uniquely owned. I would say the journey that we're on on today, marketing is absolutely a, a part of, and that this next phase for us is actually looking at like how we apply that concept to our best drivers and riders. Um, and so how do we actually create proactive support models that um, identify when our top uh, riders, so riders that have pink or our top drivers, so drivers that are platinum and drive for us a lot when they experience problems and how we, how we can remediate those in the moment and get them really easy access to like incredibly skilled associates for the pro- type of problem they're having. And so as we've been designing those things, our product marketing team has been heavily involved in like, how do we start to connect these to different proactive touch points in, in the app um, and, and build kind of a more holistic service around, around support. But early COVID, um, it, it was it was chaotic and and it was a problem that we were we were tackling kind of in our customer service customer experience silo. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So Eric, are things back to normal at Lyft now that it's April of 2022? Yeah, it's um, I would say it's a new normal. Um, we we announced it within the last uh, 30 days that we're moving to a flexible. Uh, workforce. And Mm -hmm. I I think our terminology is flex first. So we still have offices in Nashville and San Francisco and Seattle and New York. Um, But uh, people can choose whether or not they come in. And uh, in Nashville in particular, uh, this is a little bit of a tangent, but on Christmas Day, two years ago, there was a bombing and the bomb went off a few doors down from the lift office in Nashville. And so our office on top of being closed closed for COVID was was also impacted by the bombing. So we just recently reopened our office in Nashville, and it's been uh, it's been really interesting seeing everyone return. Like uh, was in the office this past week, and we had forty or fifty people, folks that I've seen at coffee shops over the past two years, um, but we haven't come in in person. And we're actually having our first in-person offsite uh, next week here in Nashville, which should be incredibly fun. And mm-hmm. so it's not, it's not quite normal. Um, I, I don't think the world's fully, fully returned to normal, but it's getting back to getting back to some of the things that, that feel more normal, like going into the office and coming together um, for, for offsites. Mm-hmm. And as far as numbers of people taking lift rides, is that back up um, like pre COVID numbers? Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely rebounded, um, uh, and obviously recovery will continue probably for the next uh, year or two. But um, it it's recovered uh, tremendously from from the dip two years ago. People are back commuting to offices, like like I mentioned. People are back traveling. Um, lots of people going in and out of the airport, and and so what we're what we're trying to do is like it's not normal like it was two years ago. But it is normal in the sense that like people's travel patterns have changed. And so the, the pieces, the, the places that we put focus on customer experience are around um, how people are using our service today. So we're seeing a lot more airport travel. And so looking at how do, how do we design a better experience um, for that? Mm-hmm. And, and so I, I think as our consumer adapts, like we're adapting as well. And we have a lot of um, new services that candidly we didn't have pre-pandemic as well. So like Lyft rentals took off um, over the past two years. Um, letting, Wait, what is that? Uh, regular... It's uh, so like you as a Lyft user can rent a car um, and it's part of our kind of fleet uh, fleet technologies. It's honestly, I did it for a trip that I had in SF about six months ago. It is like the easiest rental experience um, that I've ever had. You like rent it through the app, you tap, you pick up the car. You don't really have to talk to anyone. You drop it back off. Um, and so looking at applying kind of the, the ease that you have for, for rideshare to other verticals, um, and then we're adapting all of our customer support, customer experience around these, these kind of new services as well. 
Yeah, that's a great market to disrupt because running a car is a complete nightmare. I've really never had an easy experience running a car. Well, you should try Lyft rentals. Yes. Um, they're, they're in a few markets and it is remarkably seamless from every, um, every rental car experience that I've, I've had on other big players. Well, good for you. Good for you. Well, we have to wrap up with some fun questions, the rapid fire round. Are you ready to take some quick questions from me? Let's do it. All right. You're stuck on an island, Eric. You have access to water, but you can bring other one other food and one other drink. What are they? Oh, I would say red wine, because if I'm alone, that feels right. And then pizza always. Okay, awesome. What is the best music or band of all time? I really like Tallest Man on Earth. It's a good go-to. It's probably very niche. Not a lot of people have heard about it. But I also saw Matt Kearney in concert over the weekend at the Ryman, and that was a phenomenal show as well. If you could have lunch with anybody dead or alive, who would it be? I still feel like Obama would be such a fun hang. So I'd say President Obama. A lot of people say that. What is your most embarrassing work moment? It's a good one. I um, I try to avoid uh, embarrassing work moments, and I probably won't go to too much detail since this is going to get posted. But uh, Lyft ha- has had some fun holiday parties in the past, and so we we had one at the Sporting Club. And if any um, Lyft team members from Nashville hear it, uh, hear that, they'll probably know what I'm referring to. But you're not going to tell us what happened. No, no, oh, absolutely not. All right. <laughs> Um, okay. If you had $1 billion, what would you do with it first? Um, I, I think there's an incredible amount of problems that are happening in the world today. Um, my heart breaks for my, my friends in, in the Ukraine. And so I, I would definitely give money to help like refugees going over the border. Um, I, I also uh, think there's... Uh, a lot of problems here at home to to solve. And there's some awesome nonprofits both here in Nashville and across the U.S. to do it. And so I, I'd probably say a mixture of nonprofits both here and abroad um, on problems that I care about. And lastly, what is one tool that you personally use for self-development and growth during COVID? Um, I discovered the Libby app over COVID. It's like a access to your local library, except it connects to your Kindle. Um, and that's been awesome. Been reading a lot more. So it's not a app in particular. I, it is an app, but um, it opens up uh, as opposed to buying like every single book that I may or may not read. It opens up kind of having library books at, at your fingertips. Um, mm-hmm. But library has everything. I just mm-hmm. never got to the library before and now it's on my Kindle. So it makes it yeah. a lot easier. That's amazing. Well, Eric, this has been really fun and I hope you'll come back um, in another little while and tell us about all the cool stuff happening at Lyft. So I really appreciate you being here with our listeners and me. Yeah, Blake, thank you so much for having me um, on, on the podcast. It's been tremendously fun. Good. Have a great rest of your day. Oh, good. Everybody, you've been tuning into the Modern Customer Podcast. If you have a minute, please leave me a quick iTunes review so more people will find this growing show. Until next time, thanks for tuning in.